As we turn to chapter 3 of Galatians, we are entering into a new segment of Paul's argument. In chapters 1 and 2, Paul has begun to lay out his claim to be an apostle as over against the false apostles who were coming to Galatia. And at the end of chapter 2, he made the claim that um, we've seen over the course of two sermons that those who will be saved are justified by faith alone. And beginning in chapter 3 and going all the way until chapter 4 and verse 11, Paul is going to give a series of arguments defending what he has said in chapter 2, verses 15 to 21. So in order to understand what it is that we're looking at this morning, we want to understand that it is Paul proving what he has already said in the previous chapter about justification by faith alone. And the first argument that he's going to make to the Galatians is going to be an argument from their own experience. Namely, their experience in receiving the Holy Spirit. <coughs> the argument runs through verses 1 through 5, and it is, it is again, Paul's appeal to the Galatians of, here is the very experience that you have. The Galatians are tempted to turn to the law in order to continue on in the Christian life, and Paul is reminding them that this is a contradiction of everything they've already experienced and everything that they already know. We can see the argument of this text in three main parts. The first thing that Paul is going to do is remind his readers of the seriousness of heresy. Second, he is going to remind them of what it means to have received the Holy Spirit. What is it Paul is going to say that, that is meant or is signified in God's plan of redemption by the sending of the Holy Spirit and his reception among the people of God. <clears throat> and finally, Paul is going to reflect on the sanctification of our humanity by the Spirit in light of the promises of the Gospel. We'll look at each of these this morning in turn. The first thing that Paul wants to tell us and to remind us is the seriousness of heresy. Verse 1 forces us to consider carefully how somber, and how serious Paul finds false teaching. We live in a day and in an age when false teaching is considered to be simply a matter of difference of opinion, where all sorts of uh, Christian, or I'm sorry, heretical groups are given the name Christian. We are no longer holding to the doctrinal truths that the church has confessed of old. In fact, it seems that the only heresy in the modern world is believing that there is such a thing as heresy. <laughs> but Paul believes false teaching to be more serious than a mere matter of opinion. In chapter 1 of Galatians, he has already asserted that those uh, who teach a false gospel are, under, are subject to eternal condemnation. Here he comes to the conclusion that for the Galatian Christians to accept the doctrines put forward by the false teachers is for them to have been bewitched. And the concept that he's drawing on here is this concept of someone casting an evil eye on someone. It's, it's a form of witchcraft. The Bible has actually quite a bit to say about witchcraft, uh, which we know was prevalent in the ancient world. There were many who sought to engage uh, in some form of magical practices in order to gain power or authority. In fact, so prevalent is witchcraft that the book of Acts tells us that when the people of Ephesus converted to Christianity and they brought all of the books which they had been using to practice magic and to practice witchcraft, uh, the value of those books would have been something like six million dollars in today's currency. This was a very pervasive cult superstition in the ancient world. Both the Old and the New Testaments clearly tell us that witchcraft is associated with demonic powers and influences. In the book of Deuteronomy, witchcraft is connected with child sacrifice. In fact, there are passages throughout the Old Testament which convey the idea 
that what witchcraft ultimately is, is a seeking of demonic power for present purposes. Now, Paul gives no indication here that he actually believes witchcraft to be literally at work among the Galatians. Rather, what he is pointing out to the Galatians is that to assent to false teaching, to uh, believe doctrines contrary to the gospel is as serious as practicing sorcery and witchcraft. The false teachers are like those who would engage in sorcery, leading the people of God astray. In fact, Paul's point is likely to raise the reality in his listeners' minds that false teaching is as demonic as witchcraft. A false gospel, brothers and sisters, is not something to be taken lightly. It is a serious threat to the people of God, which we must vigilantly, vigilantly watch for and combat. Let's not forget ever that doctrine is actually of the utmost importance in the Christian life. If you are a member of Trinitas, when you joined, you made vows about protecting the peace and the purity of the church. Those vows mean that each of us has an obligation uh, to know the truths of the gospel in order that we might defend them against false teaching. Just as the scriptures teach us that there are no doctrine-only Christians, those who would say, well, I believe everything of the faith, but I'm not actually going to practice anything Christ commands me, so at the same time, uh, the scriptures are also emphatic that there are no practice-only Christians either. We have an obligation to protect and preserve the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so the first thing, practical point that Paul would, I think, address us with today is, do we know the doctrines of the faith? And if not, what steps are we going to take to begin learning these doctrines so that when the truth of the gospel is challenged in the world today, as it will be, we can respond to these challenges appropriately, as Paul is doing in Galatia. And so this is Paul's first opening argument, and first opening statement here is simply to remind us that what we are dealing with is not trivial, it is not light, it is not something that we can take or leave as we choose, but it is of the utmost serious seriousness in the world that God has created. In verse 2, Paul will turn to the main thrust of his argument from the Galatians' experience, namely, their reception of the Spirit. While the Holy Spirit in the Christian life is a key concept in the epistle to the Galatians, this is actually the first time in the entire epistle that the Spirit has been mentioned. And what Paul first says about the Spirit, before he says anything else, is that we, as the people of God, have received Him. And so, if we want to understand Paul's argument here, then it is necessary that we take a step back and consider what the Bible teaches us about receiving the Spirit of God. Too often we begin our theology of the Spirit, particularly um, in American culture, with Pentecost. And we think of his presence coming down at Pentecost and the giving of uh, speaking of tongues and the performing of miracles and our understanding of the presence of, of, of the Spirit, maybe not in Presbyterian circles, but certainly in mainstream American Christianity, is the idea that the Spirit is there to help us speak in tongues and perform miracles and do other really cool things. But the Bible has a much richer theology of what it means to receive the Spirit and to dwell in the presence of the Spirit of God. And so we want to look at that this morning. And we have to begin our understanding of the Spirit and the role of the Spirit in the Christian life at the very beginning of the Bible. While the Spirit is sometimes the least spoken about member of the Trinity, he is actually the first divine person explicitly mentioned in Scripture. In Genesis 1-2, it tells us that the earth, as it initially came forth from the hand of God, was formless and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. But, we read, the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. God the Father 
through his son and the effective agency of the Holy Spirit would transform this world of chaos into a habitation fit for God and man. When God creates light on the first day, what it most likely is, is a creative manifestation of the presence of his eternally divine spirit. The spirit, the third person of the Holy Trinity, equal in power and glory to the Father and the Son, radiates visibly the presence of God to the universe. And it is this light which initially brings life to creation. Furthermore, in Genesis 2-7, it is the Spirit of God who breathes into the dust and gives life to man. And when God set Adam in Eden, in Eden, it was the presence of the Spirit there which made it a temple fit for man to commune with God. As originally created, therefore, mankind was to reflect this glory of the Spirit back to the triune God, bearing the light of his glory to the rest of creation. From the beginning then, we see that life with God was meant to be life in the spirit. But we all know that Adam did not continue in the, in the estate in which God placed him. Instead, Adam sinned, defiling the garden in which the spirit had made his home. But in his mercy throughout the Old Testament, we continue to see God working through his spirit in humanity in creating a covenant people for himself. The sin of Adam and Eve is not the end of the story. The spirit is with Noah. If you read uh, in your English Bibles, uh, Genesis 8.1 will say something like, a wind blew over the face of the waters. What it most likely says is that the Spirit of God came over the face of the waters, and it is at that moment that Noah's ark is brought safely to the mountain and delivered out of the flood. When the people of Israel are sold into slavery in Egypt, it is the Spirit of God visibly manifest as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, which guides them out of Egypt into the wilderness. And in the wilderness, where the Israelites should experience death and desolation, the creator spirit in their midst ensures the wilderness becomes hospitable for the people. When Moses constructs the tabernacle, the presence of the spirit comes upon it in glory, showing the Israelites that God himself is in their midst. The same is true for the more enduring temple constructed by Solomon. When Solomon dedicates the temple, first king tells us, a cloud filled the house of the Lord. So that, the guests, or so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house. Yet, in spite of the presence of the Spirit, the people of God fall short at every turn. The Old Testament story points us to the need to have the Spirit not only around us, not only amongst us, but actually within our very hearts changing who we are. The eternal presence of the spirit, the external presence of the spirit with Noah's family does not prevent his son Ham from sinning so egregiously that Noah actually curses his son. Likewise, the external presence of the spirit with the people of Israel did not prevent them from grumbling against the spirit in the wilderness. They criticize his provision and as a result, the vast majority of them perish in the wilderness. And the external presence of the Spirit dwelling in the temple did not prevent the people of Israel from becoming so polluted with sin that the Spirit withdraws his presence from among them and casts them into exile. What the Old Testament story conveys to us, therefore, is that it is not enough to simply be in the presence of the Spirit but we must have the Spirit of God working within us if we are to be transformed. And so when the Lord sends his prophets to his people, one of the great promises of the prophetic ministry is that when God brings about the new covenant, his Spirit will not only be amongst his people, but within them. The Spirit will take their hearts of stone and make them hearts of flesh. Flesh. 
This is seen perhaps most clearly in Joel chapter 2, which we read in our call to worship this morning. The Lord, in predicting his coming again to rescue his people, declares that he will pour out his spirit on all of his people. The people would no longer be a and the people would no longer have a temple, but they themselves would be the temple of God. More than this, the coming of the Spirit would be the working of God in creating a new humanity. All of the eschatological promises, those end time promises that the people of God were looking forward to would begin to be fulfilled when the Spirit of God came upon them and began to restore them into the image, in the image of God. The story of Acts is, in many ways, the story of the fulfillment of the promises God made to the Israelites of old. When Christ ascends into heaven, he pours out his Spirit upon his people at Pentecost. The Spirit does not come and take up residence simply among the people of God, but within the people of God. So important is the outpouring of the Spirit to the gospel ministry that Paul can refer to the new covenant as the ministry of the Spirit in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. What this means is this. Jesus, the one who was crucified, died, and rose again, is the one through whom the Old Testament promises are fulfilled. The outpouring of the Spirit is confirmation that the promises of God have been fulfilled and that he is in the process of ushering in the new heavens and the new earth. And so here is Paul's question for the Galatians. Since the coming of his Spirit, since his presence is that great confirmation that the end of the ages has come upon us and that God is working his mighty salvation of these last days, since the Spirit is taking up his residence within us, not merely to conform our outward behavior, but to create a new humanity in the image of Christ, how did you receive the Spirit? And the answer for Paul is very clear. It, he was received by faith and not by works. The Spirit of God is living within you, brothers and sisters, not because you were worthy, not because he found you to be the most delightful dwelling in the universe, but because he sovereignly chose to make your poor, pitiful heart his home through faith. If you have put your faith in Christ, you have been given the Spirit as a promise that the triune God of the universe is going to make you a temple fit for his eternal glory. The heart that he found so poor and wretched and sinful, he will not leave this way. Have you ever considered that the reason the Spirit dwells in you is because he is turning your sad heart into a new Eden, into the very paradise of God? And so what Paul is going to elaborate on now is the process of the Spirit making you into his eternal temple. And this process is known as sanctification and the sanctification of our new humanity. Just as we receive the Spirit by faith, apart from the works of the law, we continue in the Christian life of sanctification also by faith. It is not merely the beginning of the Christian life, which is the product of faith, as if God says, now that you have begun in faith, you know, figure it out. Go for it. Do your own works and, and keep it up. Many of us uh, are prone to put ourselves back on this performance treadmill, that having been saved by grace, we must now maintain God's favor through our own good works and obedience. But Paul has a very different view of the Christian life. According to Paul, sanctification and growth in the Christian life, which, it, which will happen, we want to affirm that Paul is not an antinomian, suggesting that because we have been saved, we can go live however we want, right? Paul is going to say, no, no, the reception of the Spirit is going to produce holiness in us, but it is, it is produced because we continue to live the life by faith in the Son of God. Sanctification and growth in the Christian life continues to be the product of God's grace as he works in us to renew our lives. 
And here Paul gives us two very specific applications for the work of the Spirit in the Christian life. The first is the continued presence of the Spirit in the struggle against the flesh. And the second is the role of the Spirit in sanctifying our sufferings. Let's look at both of these in turn. First, the Spirit is the agent by which we are empowered to continue to struggle against the flesh. How does the Spirit help us in our struggle against the flesh? First is through his use of the Word of God. One of the greatest aids to resisting temptation is knowledge of the Word of God. From the beginning, in the Garden of Eden, when Satan comes to tempt us, he often does it by twisting God's Word to suit his own purposes. When uh, he came to tempt Jesus, he took a true biblical doctrine, right, that God is providentially in control of everything that comes to pass, and he twisted it to try to get Christ to tempt God sinfully. And as weary sinners, how often do we lack the vigilance to see when Satan is doing this to us? We take half-memorized verses from Scripture and we pull them out of their context and we use them to excuse our sinful actions. But the Bible tells us that the Word of God is actually the sword of the Spirit. It is the Spirit in His providential care for us who corrects our misunderstandings, brings the Word of God to our mind, and enables us to apply it to the specific situations in our lives. Maybe you've had this experience. Um, you're in the midst of some trial or some temp tempting circumstance, and suddenly, completely outside of yourself, uh, you call to mind some applicable passage from the Word of God which gives you strength in the midst of temptation or strength in the midst of your trials. This is the Spirit of God at work within you, and it is only the Spirit all the efforts of our own strength could not make the scriptures a sword. The Spirit must do this in us. Listen to the words of the Puritan William Gurnall. Unless the Holy Spirit lays his weight upon the truths we read and hear and engraves their image in our minds and hearts, they leave no more impression than a seal set upon a stone would do. Our study of the word cannot convince the mind or satisfy the heart until the Spirit of God comes to enforce it. And let me just tell you right now that if you crave this, if you desire more of the Spirit bringing to mind his word, that you might use it as a sword in your battle against sin, be here for the preaching of the word. It is true that the Spirit is sovereign and he can work in any way that he pleases, but he has chosen to work for, through normal, ordinary means. Guard your Sunday mornings as a precious and consecrated time as the preached word is given to you in worship and the Spirit will take that word throughout the week and transform your heart and your mind with it. Read the word. Make it a practice to be in the word daily. This is not a perfect analogy, but I know that it's one that will appeal to many people in the church in that, um, you know, the word is in a lot of ways like the Spirit's ammunition, right? Uh, how many of us would have stocked up on boxes of ammunition in, in the event that we ever needed to defend our family physically, yet have almost no spiritual ammunition in the event that we had to protect our family spiritually? But it's a very similar principle. Every promise of the gospel, every command of the Lord, every truth about the God you serve, which is ingrained into your mind and written on your heart, is ammunition the Spirit will use for the fight against the flesh, the world, and the devil. Be in the Word. Know His Word. This is the first way in which the Spirit sanctifies us as we grow into this new humanity. Not only does the Spirit bring the Word of God to our minds, but He is also actively present in transforming our hearts and wills to desire the things of God. The Christian life will always be a life of struggle against sin. But have you noticed that as you grow in your walk with the Lord, things which appealed to your sinful nature in the past now seem repugnant? 
Certain temptations which earlier in your Christian walk had such power over you are fading in their appeal, and you are learning to hate their presence within you more and more. This is the work of God's Spirit within you. You are being made perfect, Paul says, not through your own efforts to pull yourself up by your bootstraps or to white-knuckle your way through temptation, but because the Spirit is transforming you to love the things that God loves and to hate the things that he hates. Later in the epistle, Paul will describe all the glorious growth in holiness that we undergo as we walk with Christ as the fruit of the Spirit. It is the spirit working in you who produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So if some aspect of this fruit is missing in your Christian life, take a moment and reflect. Have you asked for it? Have you spoken to the spirit and prayed that he would give you peace in the midst of trying circumstances? Have you brought your anger to the Spirit and asked him to fill you with gentleness? Have you brought him your impulsive decisions, your untamed tongue, your addictive behaviors, and asked him to give you self-control? It is the Spirit through faith who subdues our flesh and calms our hearts within. But finally, the Spirit transforms our sufferings. Paul says in verse 4 that to abandon the life of faith would be to make the sufferings of the Christian vain. And the opposite of that would be this, that in Christ, by faith, our sufferings are not in vain. Christ never promises that those who believe in him will be freed from the sufferings of this life. We continue to experience heartache disease, broken relationships, and all the other pains that accompany living in a sinful world. But for those in Christ, the Spirit transforms our sufferings. He sanctifies them and gives them a new purpose. Throughout the the New Testament, we read that our sufferings are used by a loving God in order to make us more like Christ. We rejoice in our sufferings, James tells us, because they are producing hope within. Suffering, according to Peter, detaches us from the sinful ways of this world and wonderfully focuses our hearts and minds on the things which are above. All of these benefits are the product of the Holy Spirit working within us. This is not to minimize our suffering or to make light of our suffering. The reality is that we live in a very broken world, that pain is pain, and it it can be extreme and excruciating. But what Paul wants to reassure the believer is that in Christ, your sufferings are not in vain. Modern atheism has made popular the belief in the pointlessness of pain, that suffering has no purpose or value, but this is not what the Word of God tells us. What the Word teaches us is that because of the work Christ did on the cross and the Spirit working within us, our sufferings have purpose and intention in the hands of a mighty God. He is using your pain and your sufferings to make you more like his son. If you've ever broken a bone, you know that sometimes in order to set the bone correctly, the doctor actually has to re-break it. This is so that it will heal properly, conform to the way it was created to be. We live in a world that is broken by sin, but in Christ, God is re-breaking us, as it were, that we might grow properly into the image of his son. Your suffering is transforming you to be that end time dwelling place of the almighty God. All of these promises, all of this work of the spirit are received only through faith in Christ. If you're here today and you've never put your faith in Christ, these promises will elude you. I urge you to put your trust and your hope in Jesus Christ, the only one through whom you can receive all of the marvelous benefits of God and through whom God will prepare you to be an everlasting temple for his glory. If you don't know the gospel, you can talk to me, you can talk to Pastor Bosterman or one of the elders who would be happy to walk with you uh, to the life of faith.
Believer, do you ask the Spirit for aid? Know that he loves you. He dwells within you and he is making you new. Ask him for his aid and seek him in your distress and trust him to fulfill all his promises within you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that when you glorified your son and uh, and brought him up into heaven to sit at your right hand, you did not leave us alone, but you sent a comforter to be with us, to indwell us and to guide us in this Christian life. We thank you for your spirit. We pray that throughout this week, uh, your spirit would be with us, guiding us into lives of holiness, reminding us of your word, and sanctifying all of our sufferings. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.